I want to welcome you all for the Richard Scalak Memorial Lecture for 2012. I request Professor Schmidt Schoenbein to introduce the Scalak Lecture. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, this lecture series is in honor of uh, a former faculty member here in our department, Professor Richard Scalak. Uh, as you have seen in the announcement, uh, he was a uh, uh, individual who served in academia for a period of 40 years, initially at Columbia University, and then later on here at UCSD. And he was one of the pioneers in the field uh, in many regards. He tried many things the first time. Uh, he was the first one to establish a uh, mechanical model for a membrane, for a red cell membrane, that is actually being used today uh, worldwide. And uh, he was the first to compute, for example, the shape of a cell as it passes through a capillary. And uh, he became interested in mechanics of growth. He was a pioneer. Uh, uh, with uh, something that I can get at my local dentist these days, namely I can get a new tooth. And in fact, Professor Scalak, in many respects, is the, the brains behind this development, what we call today the titanium implant. Uh, this lecture series uh, in the past was always attended by Mrs. Scalak, but she passed away two years ago. And uh, I wrote, therefore, to his son, Thomas Scalak. Thomas Scalak is the vice president of the University of Virginia. And I asked him, Tom, what should I tell the audience here on this particular occasion? He, of course, would have liked to be here. And he sent me back the following notice, which I want to read to you. I would, this is now Tom quotation. I would have loved to be with you on this event, but I'm in Prague at the annual gathering of the Whitaker International Fellow in Bioengineering. This is a fitting or at least historically interesting circumstance because my father fathers, so Tom's grandfather, emigrated from Prague in what was then Czechoslovakia to New York City. My father, Richard Skalak, then was educated in public school, attended Columbia University, and eventually started the bioengineering program there, uh, there before moving to UCSD. So um, my message to you from Prague today, where I'm mentoring the next generation of biomedical engineers, a field that did not exist when my father began his schooling, completes a very lengthy circle. UCSD is a leading light of bioengineering worldwide. I have great pride for and precious memories for my time there as a graduate student. And uh, he, mem he cites specifically our founder, Benjamin Zweifach, Y.C. Fung, David Goff, Marcus Intayeda, and others. The younger generation, he calls them, of UCSD leaders and colleagues include Andrew McCullough, uh, Bernard Paulson, Shankar, Supermanium and many others continue to explore and invent at the frontiers of the field. I know that joining Shu, Bert Fang here to collaborate in biomechanics was one of the greatest intellectual and personal pleasures of my father's life. Coming here was like a new spring for him and many new projects blossomed here. He collaborated with friends spanning six continents, but La Jolla became his home. His ashes are in, scattered in the sea from a spot right off the La Jolla Cove. The, Scalak means, the name Scalak means one who lives in the hill in Czech. His journey took him around the world and to the very modern setting of bioengineering in San Diego. That's a long journey for Czech Hillbilly, best wishes to you all from Prague, and may you ever, never stop pursuing your personal adventures. It's uh, now my pleasure and privilege to introduce Professor Xu Chen. 
and I'm really honored to have you here to give the Richard Scalak Memorial Lecture. I want to, if I want to talk about Professor Shu Chen's contributions, it'll be all evening and perhaps tomorrow as well. So I'm going to be brief, but I cannot be too brief except to say a few things. Uh, recently, Professor Chen was awarded the greatest honor a scientist an engineer can receive in the United States, which is a Presidential Medal of Science. Shu's major research focus is cardiovascular physiology and bioengineering. He has contributed significantly to research in microcirculation, blood rheology, and mechano mechanotransduction, and to development of innovative technologies in stem cell research. In microcirculation, his research provided a comprehensive understanding of the influence of flow properties of blood, dynamics in microvessels, state of constriction of resistance vessels, as well as sympathetic nervous activity in circulatory regulation in response to hemorrhage and stresses. In blood rheology, Shu was the first person to elucidate the relationship between viscoelasticity of blood cells and their molecular constituents. In the field of mechanotransduction, Shu's research set the stage for developing an entirely novel field. His work on cellular signaling and regulation in response to stimuli is truly a pioneering uh, piece of work. Shu is a true Renaissance scientist. He was one of the early bioengineers to embrace stem cell research and develop a novel array technology to develop high throughput stem cell manipulation and assay. He has a patent on that. Dr. Chen's outstanding contributions to biomedical and bioengineering research are evidenced by 500 plus peer reviewed publications, 11 books, and major awards and honors that he has received. Shu's leadership in biomedical engineering is legendary. In addition to being president of FASEP, AMB, Microcirculatory Society, American Physiological Society, International Society of Biorheology, Biomedical Engineering Society, in addition to all of this, Shu was the founding chair of bioengineering department at UC San Diego. He was instrumental in creating a new institute called the National Institute of Biomedical Imaging and Bioengineering at NIH. He was one of the people who fought hard for the creation of this NIH institute. Each of the above institutes thrived under Shu's leadership, and he has set the bar for leadership. As in fact, as my colleague Paulson would call, he's a type five leader. Shu is one of the very few scientists who are members of all three national academies, the Institute of Medicine, he was elected in 94, National Academy of Engineering, elected in 1997, and the National Academy of Sciences in 2005. He's also a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, elected in 2006, a member of Academia Sinica, and a foreign member of the Chinese Academy of Sciences. He also received the Taiwan Presidential Medal of Science uh, a few years ago. Another feature that distinguishes Xu from his peers is his contribution to research training and education in the biomedical engineering field. Xu has built the Department of Bioengineering at UC San Diego to reach an eminent status, and he has trained leaders in the field of biomedical engineering and continues to be the torchbearer for promoting education in biomedical engineering. Shu is a unique individual in many ways. Most of us in this audience have benefited immensely from Shu's tutelage. He's a true scholar, a fantastic leader, and an outstanding teacher. He's the true role model for scientists. I want to summarize by saying that the motto for all our students and faculty in bioengineering, and perhaps all other departments, is the statement, be like Shu. With that, I welcome Shu to give the Richard Scalak Memorial Lecture on role of force direction in the regulation of endothelial functions. Shu. Thank you very much, uh, Shankar, for this wonderful introduction. With this introduction, I should just sit down because whatever I say cannot uh, measure up to what you have uh, uh, said so kindly, and also want to thank Gert for the uh, wonderful uh, overview of what uh, Richard has done. He has really been, he was a marvelous uh, friend and teacher and colleague, and I'm particularly honored to be uh, given the opportunity to give this lecture in his name, because I will use a few minutes actually to show our uh,
to show our relationships. He really means meant so much. Actually, he means so much today still to me. I would like to use a few minutes before my uh, talk uh, just to go over that, uh, our relationship. Uh, of course, Dick uh, was born in 1923, and he was a professor uh, at Columbia, then came to uh, UCSD. And at UCSD, he has uh, done many things, uh, as uh, Gerd already said, and then uh, uh, he also formed the Institute of Mechanics and Materials here uh, from the NSF. In 1967, my colleagues and I at Columbia published a series of three papers in science. Of course, that was a very important achievement for us, but the most important consequence is through these papers, I got to know Dick Scalak. He was uh, on sabbatical leave with uh, P.I. Brandemark. Uh, as uh, Gerd already said, Brandemark is the one who invented the, the implant, dental implant. Uh, and Dick really contributed very importantly to that uh, from a scientific point of view. And he and uh, Dick and uh, P.I. were working on the deformation of red blood cells in the living microcirculation in the human. And their paper uh, published uh, in 69 uh, in Science. So Dick read the, our papers shown on the previous slide. And he wrote to me saying that we should get together. We're both in Columbia, but we never met. He was in the School of Engineering. I was in the medical school, College of Physicians and Surgeons. So I said, yes, we definitely should meet. And uh, so uh, actually, I happened to be in Gothenburg. Actually, the three of us were together. And uh, so that started. I mean, it took uh, thousands of miles of travel to get together from Columbia. Then when we returned, we began to do a series of work uh, on the uh, modeling of red cell deformation in relation to the experiments. Uh, such as in this paper, and then we went on to look at the red blood cell aggregation. We noticed that red blood cell aggregation is such that the, surf the end cells are concaved when the binding energy is weak, but is convexed when the binding energy is strong. So we went ahead with finite element modeling and worked out the details of the energy balance within the interior of the aggregates. So it's a simple kind of observation, but you can deduce uh, fairly sophisticated results. And we enjoy being together, just like this uh, picture in a Chinese restaurant. I don't know what we're looking at, probably some sea cucumber to say, what's the viscoelastic properties <laughs> of this dish? Uh, and uh, we always have a lot of fun. And uh, this is a uh, gathering in our house. Here is uh, Anna and Dick and uh, my wife Casey and me and the Wusamis and two rheologists, uh, noted rheologists, Copley and Silberberg. And Dick has many honors, such as the Pasue Medal. He got an honorary MD degree from uh, Gothenburg. Uh, he won the, uh, let's see, this is cut off on the top. The Mavio Medal, this, Gert is a little tall, he's <laughs> here. <laughs> and Dick, uh, on my screen is all set. I probably should reset this. We're, anyway, uh, then uh, we had a lot of fun when we got a Whitaker Award. And uh, here's YC Funk, Gert. Uh, yeah, they did it. Somebody did something. <laughs> uh, here's Dick and uh, Sid Sobin. And, we we're having fun uh, celebrating the Whitaker Development Award. And here is uh, about 19 years ago, uh, almost 20 now, uh, Dick's uh, 70th birthday uh, in San Diego. And here's Anna and his uh, two sons, Steve and Tom, and uh, his two daughters and uh, daughter-in-law. So they were getting together. This is the daughter-in-law and two daughters. And then we had a celebration. That's why I'm wearing this red tie, because that day I was wearing it. Uh, and uh, Dick always wear, wore a bow tie, and now I never did. But that day I decided to wear a bow tie, and that sort of shocked him. And he was laughing, and I was saying something. And uh, then we, uh, Gerd is here presenting uh, a book uh, for his 70th birthday. Notice. Dick was putting on a tie. I made him change to a straight tie. I said, I wear the bow tie. You have to wear the straight tie. So he did. So we had a lot of fun together. And I just want to say that. And uh, 
Now I turn to the lecture itself, and the title is The Role of Force Direction in the Regulation of Endothelial Functions. Atherosclerosis is an important uh, pathology that underlies many diseases, such as uh, myocardial infarction and stroke. And these lesions are not found everywhere. Uh, for example, if you look at the straight part of the aorta, which is not uh, darkened here, they're relatively free of lesions. The lesions are usually found in the bifurcations and other areas of complex flow. Of course, LDL and other chemical factors are important in atherogenesis, but these factors are uniform everywhere. They should be the same. And yet, the disease is uh, localized in these regions. The main reason here is due to the difference in the uh, uh, hemodynamic patterns. It is well known that chemical ligands such as growth factors and hormones can interact with receptors to activate the signaling of the cells. But in recent years, it has been shown that mechanical forces such as pressure and flow can activate some sensors, including some of these receptors, similarly uh, to activate the signaling pathway to modulate gene expression, protein expression, and modify functions such as secretion, migration, remodeling, proliferation, differentiation, apoptosis, etc. This kind of mechanical transduction is an important uh, process. It's a fundamental homeostatic process in health and disease. When it's working well, we have homeostasis. When it's not going well, we have disease states. And even in disease states, we may have uh, mechanical transduction. Uh, pathways to uh, counteract the disease and restore health. Mechanical factors such as pressure and flow can affect the endothelial cells in a multitude uh, of ways. One of them is to increase the cell turnover, and as a result, the cells will divide and die, and during these processes, the intercellular junctions become leaky so that uh, LDL, which normally cannot go through the endothelial layer, now can go through these uh, leaky parts to get inside the uh, endothelium and becomes oxidized. The other factor is that mechanical factors can uh, cause the monocytes to enter into the wall. And they enter into the wall due to a number of chemokines, such as monocyte chemotactic protein 1, or MCP1 is one of them. And once they're inside the cell, they become transformed into macrophage. And that can embed the oxidized LDL to form the foam cells. The foam cells, together with the smooth muscle cells, that migrate from the media into the subendothelial layer, plus the connective tissues. They together form the atheroma, occluding the lumen. And that is the formation of uh, atherosclerosis. So hemodynamic forces, uh, there are at least two important uh, kinds. One is flow that causes the induction of shear stress, which is tangential to the surface of the vessel wall. The other is the pressure, which is normal to the surface of the uh, vessel wall. And it exerts all normal stress and uh, distension, uh, causing the circumferential stress. I will first talk about the effects of circumferential stress on the endothelial cells. And here we use an in vitro device that uh, has a uh, indenter on top of which we have a membrane. The indenter is, a, this is cross cut, actually is a cylinder, and the outside is a, also a cylindrical uh, 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 outside uh, cylinder that uh, holds the membrane here. And on the membrane, we culture the endothelial cells. You can do other kinds of cells as well. And by uh, moving the indenter up and down cyclically, when it's down, the cells are relaxed. When it's up, the cells are stretched. By configuring the device, we can induce either uniaxial stretch in one direction, or we can induce the stretch in multi-directions, or we call it a biaxial stretch. So these two kinds of stretch induces, induce two different kinds of responses. For example, if you look at the uh, acting stress fiber alignment and the cell orientation, uh, the F, the F acting is uh, stained with rhodamine, fluidine, and the cell border is stained with uh, cadenin monoclonal antibody. So you can see the cells are aligned. So are the stress fibers. And they are aligned perpendicular to the direction of stretch. The stretch is in this direction. The alignment is perpendicular to that. Biaxial stretch without a definitive direction and the stress fibers and the cells do not orient or align. 
If you induce a uniaxial stretch in this direction with different magnitudes, then you look at the polar plot of the orientation of the stress fibers. In static condition, there is no orientation. It's kind of random. At 1% stretch, still is not significant, the p-value. There is no significant orientation. By 3%, you have a borderline significance. If you use 0.05 as a uh, cutoff, then you get significance. 0.01 is not. And in different experiments, this is a sort of borderline situation. Once you go beyond that, it definitely has orientation very significantly. By 10%, it's definitely oriented. Now, the orientation of the stress fibers are regulated by the row family small GTPases. There are three of them, particularly the row uh, GTPase, because it reg it's known to regulate cell contractility and stress fibers and focal adhesions. Downstream to row, there are two mediators, uh, the row kinase or ROC and MDA. So we manipulated the uh, downstream effectors and see what's the effect on uh, the uh, uh, stretch-induced orientation of the stress fibers. So we inhibited two downstream e e effectors. One is ROC, the other is MDA, to see what's the effect on stress fiber orientation. Now, because we did the transfection experiments with this as a uh, plasmid, so we did the control plasmid transfection and did not affect the stretch-induced orientation. The stretch is in this direction. 10% stretch is perpendicular. No stretch, there is no orientation. If you uh, use the Y27632 to uh, inhibit the rock, with the same 10% stretch, you don't get the perpendicular orientation. Instead, you get a parallel orientation. So the perpendicular orientation requires an active uh, row system. Similarly, by using a uh, mutant to block the uh, MDA, we have the same kind of effects as blocking the rock. We have parallel rather than perpendicular orientation. So the inhibition of either one changed the 10% stretch induced stress fiber orientation from perpendicular to parallel. This is with the inhibition of the row system. Then we uh, activate the row system with a mutant row V14, which enhances the row activity. First, we use the GFP control we already saw before. The 10% is perpendicularly oriented. 3% is borderline. In this case, it did not orient very much. Then we use the row, row V14. If we don't do any stretch, you don't get orientation. So it is to be noted that 3% stretch, nor the row itself, give you any orientation. But when you combine them with 3% stretch on top of the row V14, then you get a perpendicular orientation very clear perpendicular orientation. Of course, 10% stretch would do that also. You can plot the results in terms of different levels of stretch and see the orientation. And this is the control, you can, the red line, that you can see that with increasing stretch, you get better and better alignment. Now, when you use the row V14, that the curve is shifted to the left. You need a less stretch to get the same kind of orientation. In fact, if you move the blue curve, which is with the row V14, to the right on the abscissa by 3%, then the two curves superimpose. That is to say, the um, row V14 that we use has an effect on stress fiber orientation equivalent to additional 3% stretch, showing that mechanical and chemical effects are interchangeable. The uh, mechanical effect is actually induced through a chemical effect, so they're mutually additive. That is about the stress fiber, fiber orientation. Now we also like to see what the signaling effects the uh, stretches have. So we look at JNK activation. And here we first show the uniaxial stretch, uniaxial, and the JNK activation is transient. It goes up at half hour, it's still significant at one hour, by six hour it's back to the uh, baseline. In contrast, if you do the biaxial stretch, then you see the JNK activation is sustained. As shown here, even at six hours, it's virtually the same as for half an hour. So these two kinds of stretch, uniaxial versus biaxial, with a direction and without a direction, give you different uh, responses to not only the stress fiber orientation, as we mentioned, but also on the time course of JNK activation. And we have the hypothesis that this remodeling in response to the uniaxial stretch leads to the subsidence 
of the JNK activation. This orientation of the stress fiber changes the intracellular rheology and causes the subsidence of JNK activation. So we did the following experiment. We first stretch in this way, and the stress fibers orient perpendicularly, and so do the cells. Now we suddenly change it back to be parallel to the orientation. So now the cell will change again in response to the new direction of stretch. In half an hour, they're in the process of changing, so you don't have a clear orientation. It's neither perpendicular nor parallel. But if you allow time, for example, after six hours, with this new direction of stretch, you see the cell once again is aligned perpendicular to the stretch, and so are the stress fibers. They are aligned perpendicular. So these results are summarized on this slide. This is the first round of uh, stretch. When you stretch, first, actually, they don't show stress fiber alignment. The JNK goes up. When the stress fiber aligns, the JNK goes down. That's the first round. Then you turn it 90 degree. When you stretch it in a direction parallel to the oriented fibers, now the JNK is activated again. The stress fibers didn't have time to orient. Now the stress fiber is oriented and the JNK subsides. So the JNK activation subsides following the stress fiber realignment. So the directionality of the mechanical stretch is such the orientation of the stress fiber is perpendicular to the direction of uniaxial stretch. And this is mediated by the rho GTPAs. And this is accompanied by the downregulation of JNK activation, becoming transient. And this represents a mechanism for the cell to adapt to mechanical strain. This involves molecular and biomechanical responses. So you have the strain always there, but inside the cell, they respond in such a way they quiescent, make the uh, signaling quiescent so the cell can uh, behave uh, well in a uh, normal way. The straight part of the aorta, uh, where the stress fibers are oriented perpendicular to the unidirectional circumferential stretch, is protected from the atherogenesis. In contrast, the branch points where the stretch does not have a clear direction are prone to atherogenesis. Now this is about the stretch. So uh, so far we talked about the effect of stretch. The uh, atherosclerotic lesions are preferentially located at the regions such as bifurcation where stretch is not directional. In these regions, the shear stress is also not directional. So now I will turn to the effect of shear stress. As we showed, the shear stress is parallel to the vessel wall as a result of the flow. In the straight part of the aorta, the um, flow is laminar. And uh, there is uh, very little monocyte adhesion. There is very little LDL permeability. I talked about the cell turnover, which caused the LDL to enter the wall. In the straight part, the laminar flow will not do that. And also, monocyte adhesion is very low. So both of these are anti-atherogenic. I'll show some slides to indicate that these are the case. In contrast, the branch points have disturbed flow. The flow undergoes eddies, and there is a recirculation. There is a stagnation point and a reattachment zone, and so forth. The monocyte adhesion is high, and so are the cell turnover rates are high, such that LDL permeability is high. And both of these are atherogenic. The way we uh, show that is to use a flow device, a flow chamber, in which we can culture the endothelial cells as a monolayer. And uh, they can be uh, uh, a monolayer cultured here. And flow is from left to right due to a hydrostatic uh, pressure difference. And we can observe it under the microscope. And uh, this will give you a certain kind of shear pad, a laminar shear flow. And also, we can use the oscillating shear flow back and forth so you don't have a direction. So either we have a unidirection flow or oscillating flow without direction. We can also uh, simulate the disturbed flow we see at the branch points by using a step at the beginning of the flow chamber. So the flow comes in, has a narrow entrance, and then get into a widened region. So the flow then go into the widened region will undergo the uh, recirculation, forming eddies with uh, disturbed flow in the reattachment zone, uh, just like the branch points. And the downstream then eventually recover the laminar flow. 
So we uh, can use these two kinds of devices so to look at uh, the effect of uh, me mechanical factors on the, oh sorry. <laughs> the, um, we can use uh, this kind of chamber to see how the mechanical factors affect uh, the uh, monocyte uh, entry as a result of NCP1, MCP1 activation, as well as to look at uh, uh, cell turnover. First, uh, let's look at the monocyte chemotactic protein 1. Uh, monocyte chemotactic protein 1 is regulated by uh, a series of phosph phosphorylation cascade. And this is similar to the chemical stimulation by forbor ester and other kinds of chemokines. And uh, shear stress can uh, activate the uh, ROS system from the GTP to the GTP bound form and activate the phosphorylation cascade involving JNK, ERK, C, John, C, FOS, and AP1, eventually causing the uh, secretion of uh, MCP1. So we look at MCP1 secretion uh, by the endothelial cell. This is uh, at a gene level. Uh, this is uh, at the mRNA level. The MCP1 is uh, taken as uh, baseline at zero time before the shear, and then with the shear, you can see it goes up to more than two times the control in about an hour and a half. Now with the sustained shearing, however, the uh, expression of MCP1 goes down, so it's transient. With uh, sustained shearing, the MCP1 does not keep up, but rather goes down. In contrast, if you have disturbed flow, it would uh, stay up. So here you can see the benefit of laminar flow on this monocyte uh, chemotactic agent, therefore monocyte adhesion. If you look at the protein level, that was gene level, you also see the MCP1 is primarily at the uh, branch point. This is the intercostal artery. Near the branch point, you have the MCP1 expression. And the white blood cell adhesion is also near the branch points. This is for uh, inflammation or monocyte adhesion. Now we turn to the proliferation. I will not show the results, but just show the uh, summary. That the laminar flow will increase P53, and two of these growth address genes, uh, GADD45 and P21, causing the decrease in phosphorylation of retinoblastoma uh, protein and cause cell cycle arrest in G0, G1 phase. This is laminar flow. In contrast, the stir flow would do exactly the opposite. We'll increase the RB phosphorylation and make the cell cycle progress. So this will increase proliferation and laminar flow will decrease proliferation. We also can uh, study the uh, flow with direction and without direction by using two kinds of waveform using the uh, rectangular flow chamber, the top one that showed on the two flow chamber uh, slide. If you have a uh, steady level of 12 dynes per centimeter square plus an oscillatory component, positive component of plus minus 4 dynes per centimeter square, this is more or less like what we see in the straight part of the aorta. And here we have a flow that is very little forward direction with 0.5 dynes per centimeter square with the same oscillation. So the difference between these two is that here we see the kind of flow that can represent a disturbed flow seeing the osteoporone region. And this is uh, with a net direction flow, which is similar to the straight part of the arterial tree. And we can use these two kinds of flow to study the expression of a transcription factor, which is anti-proliferative and anti-inflammatory, the KLF2, the Cooper-like factor 2. And this is a good transcription factor because it's anti-proliferation and anti-inflammation. We use positive shear and oscillatory shear to study its response with time. With positive shear, if we take the zero time as the baseline, you can see one hour is already up, and it keeps up for the duration of study, in this case, 24 hours. This was positive flow. So this is a good transcription factor. The positive flow will keep it up. The oscillatory flow, on the other hand, although it will go up quite a lot, but it actually goes down quickly with time. So by the time of 24 hours, it's even lower than the control. So this good transcription factor is not there if you keep on doing the oscillatory shear, like in the branch points. So KLF2 is sustained following positive shear, but not uh, 
after oscillatory shear. Not only in vitro, in vivo we can see the same thing, and this is a schematic, schematic diagram of the ab abdominal aorta with a celiac artery branch, and we cut through here. Point one is here, which is the lateral aspect of celiac artery, and two is the medial aspect, and three is the uh, main abdominal aorta. We can blow up these areas. You can see the staining of KLF2. It's very well stained in this laminar flow region, three here. And it's well stained also in, the me in this uh, medial aspect of the branch. But in the lateral aspect of the branch, that's where the flow is disturbed. You do not see the KLF2 staining. So this is the same as what we see in vitro. That is what we see with the oscillating flow and what we see with pulsatile flow. So the uh, expression is high in regions of high shear and low in regions with disturbed flow. And uh, it has been shown uh, that uh, lipid accumulation is near the orifice where this disturbed flow occurs and atherosclerotic lesions is also shown there. So to summarize, the flow pattern, if it's laminar, like in the straight party aorta, the endothelial cell turnover and LDR permeability is low. In contrast, at a branch point, these are high. And monocyte adhesion is uh, low in the straight part in, with laminar flow, and the disturbed flow at a branch point it is high. So all of these then uh, cause atherogenic effect uh, for the branch points and anti-atherogenesis for the straight part. Now, in order to get these results, we have uh, many uh, multifactorial mechanotransduction. The mechanical stimuli can activate a lot of uh, these uh, protein sensors, such as receptor tyrosine kinase, like VGF receptor 1, G protein coupled receptors, ion channels, junction proteins, and integrins on the basal side, as well as the lipids in the membrane and the carbohydrate. Uh, on the outside, the gylecocalyx, which are linked to the proteins on the inside. So all of these can respond to the mechanical stimuli. Unlike the chemical stimuli, they're very specific. VEGF will only go to the VEGF receptor, but here they are very diverse, many different inputs. And once you go inside, then the um, signaling pathway is very diverse. There are many of these pathways. I mentioned the ROS, J, and K. We mentioned the Rho and ROC, but there are many others, such as NF kappa B and all the others. Uh, the, uh, once you get to the gene expression, of course, the genes interact with each other as a network, and the proteins can come back, affect all these things. So what we have shown is a very simple, sort of linear kind of effect. In fact, it's really a network. Now I'd like to just show a slide to indicate the uh, basal aspect, the interaction between the cell and the extracellular matrix. And this is the method, uh, we, we use the method uh, uh, invented by Yu Li Wang, now at Carnegie Mellon, that is he used these little beads in a gel uh, that are fluorescent. Then you put fibronectin on top of that, and the cell on top of that. The cell will exert a traction force and the beads will be moved by the cell as a result of the traction force, and from that you can back out the kind of uh, forces the cells see. And this is the work uh, done by Song He and others in our lab, uh, together with uh, uh, Drs. Uh, Juan Lacharis uh, and J.C. Uh, Del Alamo. And this is uh, the DIC picture that shows the cell is moving in this direction, and this is at zero time, and this is at 10 minutes later. If you compare the two, you look at a paxillin standing, zero time is as red, and 10 minutes is green. You can see the motion of these beads. And we call the uh, protruding part the laminopodia forming region, and the retraction part in the re re rear as the R, and the nucleus region is N. And you can uh, see the vector uh, of the uh, plot of the uh, tension in the xy direction, they're inward. Uh, the cell actually grabs onto it before it moves forward, and you can see the, uh, the contour plot. It is higher in the perimeter. Uh, in terms of the normal direction, in the z direction, you see the um, forces are upward uh, in the perimeter of the cell and downward in the center of the cell. And in all these regions, the uh, forces 
uh, in the XY direction can be related to focal adhesion area from the paxillin standing. You can see the focal adhesion area, whether it's the uh, leading edge or the uh, backside or the nuclear, even though the slopes are different, but each region is related to the focal adhesion that generates, uh, causes the force uh, to uh, vary. And in the Z direction, you can see the leading and uh, retracting areas, they're uh, in, upward, it's plus, but in the nuclear region, it's negative, it's downward. We can also look at the junctions. The junction proteins can affect uh, the endothelial cell behavior. And here we look at uh, V cohering standing in the endothelial cells exposed to two kinds of flow. In the static situation, we have very nice standing of the V cohering for the junction proteins. But exposing to positive flow or oscillatory flow, you disrupt the junction initially. But you allow time, you see the positive flow will restore the junction. Now the cells are aligned with flow in this direction, but the oscillatory flow never recovers the junction. So the junctions are not working that well. And as a result of uh, the forces applied, we can also affect the cytoskeletal remodeling. For example, without the force or if the flow is disturbed, the orientation of these fibers, including the stress fiber acting, the microtubules, intermediate filaments, they're random. But with 24 hours of laminar flow, you can see the orientation of these stress fibers and other kinds of uh, cytoskeletal elements. So this is just like the stretch. You can see the alignment of the uh, fibers. This time is parallel to the direction of flow. So the application of the external stress can change the internal stress and strain, including the remodeling of the uh, system. So the directionality of the stress is very important in the maintain maintenance of homeostasis because with a direction you can get remodeling, you can change the intracellular behavior, including signaling. If you don't have a direction, like in disturbed flow region, you don't have this feedback. And uh, JC, uh, Del Alamo and Juan Lacharis and others, uh, we have worked on this uh, uh, using this directional particle tracking microreology, DPTM, to look at the um, changes in the intracellular rheology. This is uh, really the Laplace transform of the equation of uh, momentum uh, and uh, a sign in, of a uh, sphere uh, in uh, a uh, non isotropic medium so that it can have uh, a uh, viscosity that's uh, diagonalized in the uh, J direction is the motion and I is the resistive force. And then you can calculate, compute the direction of viscosity in the softer direction and in the stiffer direction. So you get the direction of viscosity as well as the directional creep compliance. Of course, the compliance will be opposite in direction to the viscosity. And then we can get local directionality and the values of viscosity and creep compliance. And we have to use some particles inside the cell. And we look at different kinds of particles and we picked uh, actually the mitochondria as the uh, particles to track. And uh, this can be seen. In this, uh, you can see the motion of these particles and this is due to Brownian motion thermal Brownian motion. And from the Brownian motion, we can back out the viscosity in the two directions and, uh, or the creep compliance. And this plot is to show that in individual cells that are in a static condition, there's no flow. So that static condition and the distribution of the angle of the uh, creep compliance is non-uniform among the individual cells. Some are aligned this way, others are aligned the other way, some are uniformly aligned, but the overall effect is there is no orientation. The composite is uniform in the static condition. In contrast, we can apply shear flow in this direction, then you see the majority of the cells have their uh, alignment of the uh, creep align, uh, compliance in the direction of flow. So the overall in the flow situation is aligned with flow and the static condition is all around. And this gives an indication of how the intracellular rheology is changing, particularly in terms of its direction in response to the flow. And this in turn affects 
the signaling and other behavior of the cell. Now I mentioned about stretch earlier, and now we're also working on the stretch. Actually, this is the work done by uh, a group of uh, students uh, in um, mechanical, aeros mechanical aerospace engineering and in bioengineering uh, with uh, JC and Jason Haga, who worked together. And yesterday at Research Expo, this particular poster won the award. Actually, otherwise I wouldn't have shown that, but I just put it in after they won the award because we didn't have it finished yet, this study. So this is the orientation. Uh, if this, they pick the cells that are oriented this way and a stretch in the same direction, see if they were turned. And uh, you can see that this is at zero time, at 60 minutes, 120 minutes, 180 minutes, 240 minutes, and 300 minutes. So they turned vertically, exactly as we had expected from the stretch direction in the earlier work, we showed that the stress fibers are aligned this way, but now the rheology, it shows, out, shows up is in the right direction that we expected. So not only the structure, but also the function of rheology that is in the right direction. So this really supports our uh, thesis. Sorry. So this is just to say, again, that the intracellular uh, stress and strain is important. The endothelial cell can respond to directional stress by remodeling its intracellular mechanics to maintain homeostasis. So the summary on the studies on the directions of stretch and, and shear is that first, the orientation of stress fibers in the straight part of the aorta is perpendicular to the uh, circumferential stretch. See, the stretch of the aorta is this way, and the fibers are lying this way and parallel to the direction of flow. The flow is in this direction, and the stress fibers align this direction. So it's, there's no competing influences. The two are synergistic. The stretch and shear give you the same alignment in that direction. And this is a way of cell adaptation to the mechanical stimuli. This feedback control is uh, very important uh, to maintain homeostasis. If you don't have such directional stretch, like in the branch point, you're prone to arthrogenesis. Now I'd like to uh, use a little bit of the time to uh, talk about microRNA in the regulation of endothelial responses to shear flow. The microRNA is recently di discovered. Uh, in addition to the messenger RNA, which responds to the uh, which is uh, as a result of the transcription from the DNA and then translate to protein to give you function. This is the classical uh, dogma of molecular biology. But in recent years, it's known these little microRNAs can affect uh, the messenger RNA either by increasing degradation or re repress their transcription. And uh, as a result, you can change the uh, efficacy of the uh, mRNA. So the uh, microRNA have their primary uh, microRNA, which is larger than the 22, then becomes a pre-microRNA, which goes out of the nucleus and then uh, become the uh, two, uh, 22 nucleotide strands. That's the microRNA that does the targeting uh, of the uh, downstream. And in our lab, we have studied two micro several microRNAs, but I'll show two of them. The first one is microRNA 23B in the anti-proliferation action of pulsatile shear. And this is the pulsatile shear, and uh, we, we know that uh, in the static situation, you have the S phase, synthetic phase like this much, but with pulsatile shear, you drop that down so much that is really, really anti-proliferative, and uh, this is the difference. Also, with uh, laminar shear, you decrease the BRDU uptake. That means uh, you decrease the proliferation. So pulsatile shear is anti-proliferative, uh, anti proliferative, and uh, together with this, we see the uh, messenger RNA expression. The cell cycle-related genes are, some are upregulated, such as CDK2 and 4, and whereas the growth arrest genes are, uh, are the, this, I got it reversed, the growth arrest genes uh, with pulsatile flow is upregulated, and the results can be subjected to uh, goal uh, annotation and pathway analysis. But more importantly, I'd like to talk about the microRNA. And the one that we'll talk about is 23B. Another is 27B, because those two uh, are known to be related to the cell cycle. 
And Posner shear has been shown to upregulate both of these genes, as shown on this slide. These are three different experiments. They show fairly uh, consistent results. Now, the first two sets of experiments are the controls. That's just uh, using, uh, we use antagomere. This is like sRNA, uh, similar to that, to block the mere 23B using its antagomere. We use a control antagomere that does not block uh, 23B. Then we use post shear. We see the results we saw before. We decrease the S phase. That means reduce the synthesis. But now if you come in and block the uh, 23B, you can see that post shear does not give you as much suppression of the uh, S phase uh, with post with this antagomere there. That means mere 23B is contributing to this effect of post shear. In contrast, the 27B, even though it's also upregulated, when you use its antagomere, it did not change the effect with post shear. Whether you use the antagomere or not, it's the same. So it's only 23B that gives you this uh, blockade. And another uh, important molecule is uh, RB. Its phosphorylation is important for the uh, proliferation. And blockade of mere 23B can abolish the uh, post shear repression of uh, RB phosphorylation, as shown here. RB phosphorylation is suppressed if you use a control antagomere, but you come in with antagomere for 23B, you take away this uh, blockade and of uh, the S uh, of the phosphorylation of RB. But 27B does not do that, so only the 23B is doing that. So 23B is really mediating the post shear induced RB phosphorylation reduction and decrease uh, proliferation. But there are other uh, mic microRNAs that also play a role because this did not block it totally. Now we'd like to use the last part to talk about the, another microRNA, MIR-21, in the pro-inflammatory action of oscillatory shear. So we have the post shear, which is uh, anti-proliferative, and oscillatory shear, which is pro-inflammatory, also pro-proliferative as well. But I focus now on the uh, this uh, inflammation. So MIR-21 can uh, enhance the uh, inflammation. This is opposite to what the MIR-23B does. And here is showing what the um, oscillatory shear does to the MIR-21. You can see the oscillatory shear increases the MIR-21, although it's not uh, that high at 24 hours, but lasts as long as that. Uh, the post shear, on the other hand, did the opposite. If anything, it drops the uh, uh, MIR-21. So oscillatory shear increases the MIR-21 expression. And oscillatory shear also enhances monocyte adhesion and VCAM expression, as shown on these two slides. And these effects are blocked by the antagomere for 21. And here we come in with 21. You block this effect of oscillatory shear, of oscillatory shear on the uh, cell uh, adhesion. Also, it blocks the uh, VCAM expression. And if you overexpress MIR-21, on the other hand, you increase the uh, monocyte adhesion. So all of these point to the uh, relationship between oscillatory shear and monocyte adhesion is mediated by the MIR-21. MIR-21 can also activate the C-JUN. As shown here, MIR-21 activates C-JUN. If you use antagomere to MIR-21, the C-JUN goes down. So MIR-21 activates C-JUN. So there's an interplay among the oscillatory shear, MIR-21, and C-JUN, which is part of the AP1. With artery shear, when the MIR-21 is working, you have this uh, increase in C. Jung. But if you have the anti-MIR-21, then the artery shear no longer increases C. Jung. So artery shear induced the increase in C. Jung is mediated by MIR-21. So this is the kind of schematic drawing that we can uh, show this effect. Now, the question is, what mediates this effect of MIR-21 to the AP1? So we started to look at PPAR alpha. The reason for that is from the bioinformatics database, we found that PPAR alpha uh, is related to the MIR-21. So we come in with the PPAR alpha with adenovirus transfection, and uh, you can see that if you take the control primary MIR-21, the pre-MIR-21, and mature MIR-21, 
take them as the baseline here, all three of them dropped down to 30% or less. So PPAR alpha decreases the MIR-21 transcription. And PPAR alpha also inhibits the MIR-21 activation of C. Jung. This is using this uh, TRE, which is the uh, uh, cis element for the uh, AP1, the C. Jung. And uh, we use luciferase reporter to look at its activity. And we can see that uh, with control virus, we get a very strong uh, effect uh, on the luciferase in response to MIR-21. But if you now come in with the adenovirus PPAR transfection, then this MIR-21 effect is greatly reduced. Even the control is reduced. So now we see that the PPAR alpha actually provides this intermediate. So for the MIR-21 to act on the AP1. And of course, you get a, a MIR-21 pr primary produce that can feed back. So this actually becomes a positive feedback circuit. And uh, it's uh, quite uh, interesting. So to summarize, then the MIR-23B mediates the uh, PS-induced uh, inhibition of the proliferation. MIR-21 mediates OS-induced monocyte adhesion. So this in involves PIPA alpha and C. Jung. The complex role of, MIR 20, uh, of the MIRs is mediated by these and other effects of shear flow on EC function, and they require uh, systematic uh, investigation with system biology approach. And this is what we're doing with Shankar and uh, Kadir Tung, a graduate student uh, in, our lab, in his lab, and uh, we can form these kinds of uh, network analysis, but this is just a preliminary. We are going to go into the depth. And finally, I want to say that we also use this approach to look at the mRNA expression. And for example, post shear versus static, we look at the uh, gene expression, uh, mRNA. These are uh, at different times, we see the uh, gene expression changes, such as the cycling, CDC, CDK, and CDK inhibitors that are related to the uh, cell cycles. And uh, this is to show that one hour, the some of the genes are activated. At four hours, more will be activated. By by 12 hours, that one is chopped off. The 12 hours, then uh, the network is more, even more complex, and we're uh, trying to uh, elucidate the relationship uh, in our current studies. So in summary, the orientation of stress fibers in the straight part of the aorta is perpendicular to the circumferential stretch and parallel to the direction of laminar flow. And this alignment represents the cell adaptation to the mechanical stimuli. The feedback control here is important for the cells to maintain homeostasis. Homeostasis, if you lack this kind of control, then you tend to have arthrogenesis. The microRNA plays an important role in the regulation of these responses to directional mechanical stimuli. And uh, we need to do a lot more work to get these all together. And I want to acknowledge the collaboration at UCSD of many colleagues. Some of them I do not put in because the work is not directly shown on these slides. And also in other uh, institutions, including Berkeley, Irvine, Riverside, and UC System, uh, Illinois, uh, China, and Taiwan. So all of uh, these collaborations have made possible these uh, studies. Of course, most of all, I want to thank Dick Scalag, because without him, I would not be here today. I would not have been in engineering, not in bioengineering, not in, at UCSD. So I want to dedicate this to Dick, and thank you very much. Thank you very much. Would you like to ask? Yes, please. Uh, In your in vitro system, you could try to confuse your endothelial cells. You could give them uniaxial stretch in, in one direction and then give them flow in one or the other direction. Uh, who wins? That's a good question. We have not done that. Uh, uh, my sus suspicion is that uh, whichever one is stronger will win because you know each one has a magnitude-dependent response. Like stretch, I showed. 10% versus 3%, there is a difference. Uh, and shear is the same way, whether it's 6 times per centimeter square or 12. So one can titrate that, but we have not done that. Yeah, Garrett. Yeah. Can I ask you to point? Medically? 
scissors. Is there anything you can do at the branch point yeah. clinically? Well, there is nothing you can change the geometry. Uh, I think the geometry is there by necessity because we have one aorta, you get down to billions of capillaries. The only way to get there is by branching, so you have to branch. And I suspect that the branching is already uh, optimized during evolution, the angles. And I don't know why, for example, at the kidney, the branching is right angle almost. But in other places where iliac is certainly like a Y, inverted Y, which is necessary because the two legs, you have to do it that way. And, uh, but it's, I think it's already optimized, and you cannot surgically changing the uh, branch points. I certainly would not uh, think of doing that. One way we can do is to change the, uh, the point of the stagnation point, the location of the stagnation point, and that is where exercise will do it. When we do exercise, you see the cardiac output can increase, or oh, more than double, can be three times. It depends on the severity. When the cardiac output increases, everywhere the flow increases. Of course, the muscle is more than the others, but everywhere the flow increases. And here, um, like in the uh, aortic branch points, the flow is increases. When the flow increases, then the whole, you know, the recirculation pattern and so forth moves. If you increase the flow, the recirculation will move downstream. So it's, you're not hitting that same point again and again. Like if I sit at a computer all day long, that's not good because the stagnation point is always the same. But if I go out and run, then you move to another point. That's probably why the physician would tell us that you have to do it at least three times a day, each time at least 40 minutes. And you have to get heart rate up to you know 110, 120, whatever, depending on the age. I think all of these show how to increase the flow, really, not only transiently but with a sustained manner. So you move the stagnation point out outward. Well, let's uh, thank uh, Professor Chen for a phenomenal lecture, and I would like you to join us outside for a reception for Professor Chen. And uh, before we do that, uh, we would like to give the flag for Professor Chen. I'd like to request Professor Schmidt-Schoenbein joining me in uh, giving the flag to Professor Chen. Chen. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> He's a tall man, so he can. <laughs> Over here. <Yeah. laughs> that sounds good. The flag reads the University of California, San Diego, Department of Bioengineering and the Institute of Engineering and Medicine, Richard Kalak Memorial Lectureship presented on April 13th, 2012 to the University Professor Shu Chen for its extraordinary service to bioengineering and outstanding research and teaching in vascular bioengineering. Professor Chen. I request you to join us out at the reception and meet with Professor Chen. Thank, thank you, thank you very much. Mike, well, nice. it's quite a surprise. Right. Wow. I didn't run over time, did I? No, no, no. I was speeding up a little. You covered a lot of time. Yeah. So. <laughs>